Hello, welcome to our program of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, coming to you from the campus of the University of Oklahoma with our Stevenson Cancer Center, as you see in the background here. Our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, which is a joint venture with the Digital Pathology Association and Path Presenter. Uh, which allows us to uh, share these nice digital images and presentations in a very facile format. We hope that it's of use to you in your learning and in your coming to understand some of the diseases that we talk about in these programs. Our case today comes from the realm of soft tissue pathology. Uh, it's a adolescent boy with six, uh, 16 years of age who has a mass on the volar aspect of his distal upper extremity. Uh, it's been there for some time and is starting to uh, become a little bit ulcerated, um, <clears throat> leading to some concern. So in adolescents and young adults, what should we be thinking about in terms of uh, soft tissue masses? Well, certainly uh, post-traumatic masses, uh, inflammatory lesions, hamartomas, sometimes vascular tumors or myofibromas. Uh, can present in these situations. Lipomas less frequently in children and uh, early adolescents. Um, but most of the lesions are going to be benign. And because of that, because we don't think malignancy, sometimes they get delayed a little bit, uh, either by the patient or uh, often as not by the physician. But there are a significant number of malignant lesions that can present as soft tissue masses in an adolescent. And these include uh, a variety of lymphomas and uh, granulocytic sarcomas, uh, as well as the more conventional sarcomas like rhabdomyosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, synovial sarcoma, fibrosarcoma, malignant peripheral nerve sheath uh, sarcoma, as well as other uh, nerve-derived uh, uh, malignancies, and uh, epithelioid sarcoma. <laughs> So a uh, biopsy was done of this uh, lesion and we got some fragments of tissue, as you can see, some uh, dense fibrous tissues, fatty tissue, and then some slightly more cellular tissue here. Um, and uh, as we look at this, I think uh, you'll find it very easy to recognize that there's some inflammatory processes going on here. And uh, it, it might look like these are just a bunch of histiocytes. Uh, and you might be thinking, well, this is some sort of an atypical inflammatory lesion uh, with this uh, nice background here, and uh, maybe this patient has some granulomatous disease or something of that sort. But if you hone in on these uh, histiocytoid-like cells, in fact, you see they're, they're quite epithelioid, and there's quite a degree of uh, nuclear atypia, nuclear enlargement, uh, some, some binucleation. Uh, there's angulation, and there's certainly some variability in size and shape. Uh, you may also be able to recognize uh, a few apoptotic bodies and uh, possibly even some mitotic activity in these uh, lesions. So uh, this degree of atypia should not just be assigned to inflammatory reactive atypia, uh, but should warrant some further evaluation. To exclude um, a number of those uh, malignancies that I just mentioned. Let's look at some of the other areas in this lesion. You see there's some dense fibrous tissue. And of course, if you just biopsy this, you might say, well, it's just some scarring and inflammation. Uh, there's not much here um, to make a diagnosis of malignancy from. Um, and then sometimes you'll get maybe just a piece that looks a little bit like this where you've got a few of these cells scattered around, um, a little bit of atypia, but maybe not very overwhelming. You kind of could easily wonder if this is just some, some uh, fluke of the inflammatory process. And that's the reason why sometimes these lesions are missed in the first go round, is that uh, we don't pick up on these uh, subtle but significant cytologic uh, atypical changes in these single cells, the mitotic activity, the single uh, epithelioid cells here, and then go after them with the appropriate workup. Uh, so this is a, a disease which uh, can be uh, delayed in diagnosis uh, a number of times. And so you've probably already guessed uh, that we're dealing here with a malignancy 
Um, and out of that list that I just shared with you, uh, the most likely disorder to present in this manner uh, would be epithelioid sarcoma. So in fact, uh, we would do a few additional stains on this lesion. And uh, here's the cytokeratin stain, which as you can see, uh, picks up these cells quite nicely uh, with uh, CK, pan-CK. Uh, and many of these individual cells and small groups of cells light up. <clears throat> now this might be the pattern that we would see in a you know, pleural or, or mesothelial uh, uh, metastasis from a poorly differentiated gastric carcinoma. Uh, but in an adolescent, that would be a highly unusual uh, presentation. Um, additionally, these cells were uh, positive with uh, EMA, uh, as you can see here. Uh, again, they light up nicely with this uh, stain. Uh, but the uh, really the uh, uh, clinching diagnostic uh, stain is uh, that for INI1. Uh, now, we in our laboratory, we use BAF47. Um, <clears throat> there are other uh, antibodies that also recognize this epitope. And what uh, we're looking for is uh, the contrast between uh, normal cells, which should retain this marker, as you see here in the lymphoid cells, and the lesional cells, which have lost expression. Uh, so when INI expression, INI1 expression is lost, that's usually an indication of a SPARC-B1 mutation or an INI1 deficiency mutation that is associated with a relatively small number of uh, malignancies, including uh, <clears throat> epithelioid sarcoma. And it is certainly the only one which has this morphologic uh, appearance. So um, what is epithelioid sarcoma? Well, this is a tumor that occurs in both pediatric and adult populations. And it sort of has two uh, general uh, sort of phenotypes or expression types. A, a sort of classic type that it occurs in the distal extremities, peripheral, um, and then a more central or proximal type. Um, both of these have mutations of the INI1 or SMARC-B1 com complex. Um, and as I've mentioned, they can oftentimes mimic inflammatory or ulcerating disease, especially the classic peripheral types. I mentioned the, the IHC, PAN-CK, and other cytokeratins. These cells will also be positive with pimentin. So this is one of those uh, relatively small groups of tumors that can co-express bimentin and cytokeratin right there along with endometrioid carcinomas, renal cell carcinomas, and uh, one or two others. Um, and importantly, uh, we mentioned it's negative for INI1, but it's also negative for some of the uh, differential considerations like S100, FLY1, if you're thinking about angiosarcoma, CD31, also for angiosarcoma, CD68, if you're thinking uh, histiocytic response, and so forth. And so completing the uh, workup with these other stains may be valuable uh, in helping you to uh, comfortably exclude these more, more, uh, more frequently found uh, tumors like um, malignant peripheral nerve sheath to their tumors, myoepithelial tumors, both of which would be S100 positive, uh, epithelial angiosarcoma or hemangioendotheliomas, which would be CD31 or FLY1 positive, uh, and melanoma, of course, which would also be S100 positive. Well, uh, uh, in uh, the more proximal uh, type, uh, you tend to get more of the tumor bulk, and I thought I would show you this uh, a resection specimen of a proximal type. Here you see involving skeletal muscle. Um, and here we don't have quite the same degree of inflammatory uh, reaction and fibrosing reaction. But as we come into higher magnification, I think you can see that there is kind of a mixture of cells here. Uh, we have some of the uh, tumor cells that are being a little bit more spindle shaped and uh, so forth but there is an association of uh, this tumor with some inflammatory background. And we still have a few cells which have this more epithelioid uh, rounded uh, morphology, which you can see here. Uh, as I looked at this earlier, I thought, well, oh, there's a few cells that even look like uh, Reed Sternberg cells. So you might even consider some lymphomas in the differential uh, if you were to just get a small sample with the uh, owl's eye uh, binucleate uh, type cells uh, included. 
But I think you can see here there is uh, sort of this uh, heterogeneous background of inflammatory cells, karyorectic debris, red cells, and so forth, which uh, could raise the consideration for uh, vascular tumors and other sorts of lesions that we included in our differential uh, just uh, previously. And you can come back to these slides. The digital slides will be uh, linked to them uh, in the description on the video for you. So our final sign-out diagnosis on this patient was an epithelioid sarcoma of the distal or more classic type. Um, and uh, that should lead to uh, prompt therapy, um, usually fairly significant surgery, uh, plus or minus other uh, adjuvant uh, treatments. Uh, because if we can control it distally, uh, we're uh, much better off. But uh, once it begins to spread proximally, it becomes very difficult to control. Well, we hope you enjoyed that, that you got a few uh, pointers that will be helpful you, to you in your practice. And if you liked it, uh, please don't uh, hesitate to subscribe or uh, hit the like button and uh, share it with your friends. Um, we appreciate uh, your patronage of our channel and hope that these uh, will continue to provide a useful uh, adjunct in your education. Uh, so until next time, thanks so much for joining me.